Listening test one. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions, and you will have a chance to check your answers. The recordings will be heard only once. The test is in four sections. Record all your answers in your test book, and at the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to a special answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a policeman giving a talk to some students. First, you will have some time to look at questions one to six. You will see that there has been an example written for you. On this occasion, only the conversation relating to the example will be played first. And so I'd like to hand you over now to Sergeant Brown. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fogarty. Oh、uh, yes, as you know, my name is Sergeant Jeff Brown, and as Mr. Fogarty has indicated, I'll be speaking to you briefly today about security. About how to make your time at this university safer and more comfortable. Sergeant Brown is going to speak about safety, so answer B has been circled on the question page. Now we will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen to the talk carefully. And answer questions one to six. I am officially the university liaison officer, which means I have a specific brief to act as a go-between for the university and the police, if there are problems, and also to offer an official presence on or around campus and give individuals advice if they need it. Now. My job is very important to me. I take security and reducing the threat of crime on this campus very seriously, because although I don't actually live on the campus, both my daughters attended this university, and my son is still here. So, I am a local policeman in every respect. I have been the university liaison officer for the last five years, but I have been in the police force. For fifteen in all. Now on to some advice. The first thing I want to stress is that this university is a comparatively safe place to live. We have had no serious crimes here in the five years I've been here. In fact, crime of any sort is very rare on the campus. We have good security here, and although there are a lot of staff and students, the security staff, including myself, And、make an effort to get to know your faces. However, as students, it is of course wise for you to take precautions to protect yourselves against crime when you are off the campus. As I said, the campus itself is really very safe, but there is a large park right behind it, McGowan Fields. And although this is a beautiful place to sit or walk during the day, at night you must be careful. One or two students have reported unpleasant incidents at night while walking in the park. Although it must be said that no major incidents have been reported. Now, there are no areas in town which I advise students to avoid as a general rule, but the town centre is more hazardous than other areas, especially in the evenings on Friday and Saturday. On these days, there is often fighting. After people have had too much to drink in the pubs and clubs in the area, there have also been a number of robberies and muggings. Before the talk continues, you have some time to read questions seven to ten.
Now listen carefully and answer questions seven to ten. Well, that was my advice to you. Most of it is common sense, but remember, crime always happens when you least expect it. But there are ways to protect yourself. First of all, the university provides all students with personal alarms. If you are attacked, you can use this to put off your attacker. Secondly, don't take anything with you that cannot easily be replaced, like a passport or things of sentimental value. Leave jewelry and other valuables in your room when you go out. Always make sure you take something which will identify you. Perhaps your student card or your driving license. Thirdly, when you are out late at night, come home in twos. It's much safer. If you're with a friend, than on your own, and obviously don't have very much money on you. Finally, if you do know you'll be late back and can't use public transport, tell someone else when you expect to be home, and if there's a problem, they can raise the alarm. So that's about all from me, and I wish you a pleasant and safe stay here. Thank you. That is the end of section one. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear two students, Sarah and John. Discussing their choices of courses to study. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully to the discussion, and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Hi, John. Hello, Sarah. What are you doing in here? Haven't all your exams finished? Well, yes, they have, but I've got to make my decisions for next year. I still haven't chosen what courses I'm going to do. That's why I'm here. Why don't we have a look through the brochure together? That's a good idea. I'm not sure about some of these courses on medieval history. No, in fact, I'm not sure about the whole second year. I was talking to Peter Lilly the other day. You know, he's just finished the second year, and he was saying that the workload is higher in the second year because you have to read all these medieval documents in Latin. I mean, the first year has been pretty hard, but next year will be worse. There are more assignments in the second year. It goes up to six a year for each course, doesn't it? Yes. But we've got the experience of the first year to build on, so it must get easier. And there isn't so much secondary material in the second year. There aren't so many books about the medieval period. Don't you believe it? I think this year's going to be hard work. Well, perhaps I'd better give up my job then. You're working as well. Yeah, I've been working in the same place for over a year now, only part time, you know, just Saturday mornings in the market. I mean, it doesn't pay much. But it's interesting, and it gives me a bit of extra cash for my textbooks. Anyway, what about these courses? How many do we have to take? I remember Professor Bolt saying something about four courses in the second year. Is that right? Or do we have to do a certain number of credits? Both. We have to select four courses, but for some courses there are two parts. They count as one course. It's six in total because everyone has to do Europe. Eleven hundred to fifteen hundred, and Chronicles of the Church. Anyway, when you've chosen your four courses, they should add up to eighty credits. Have you got the course brochure there? Yes. Look, under second year history, there it is. You now have some time to read questions sixteen to twenty.
Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 16 to 20. Right. Yes, look. Most of these courses are 20 credits each, except for the two short courses about the Crusades. They're 10 each. Now, medieval society. Hmm. What do you think? Well, actually, I think it looks really good. Dr. Smith is OK. And you don't have to buy any books except a study pack. The best thing is there are no special requirements. No Latin or medieval English. The next one is development of technology with Mr. Mills. Ah, this is a good one. Peter recommended it. It's all about the way printing developed and early science. In fact, I think I could get a copy of Bouchier's History of Science from him. That means I wouldn't have to buy it. That does look interesting. And that doesn't have any special requirements either. What's next? Ah, here they are. Ten credits each, the Crusades. You need French to do them. I suppose a lot of the documents are in French. That's strange, look. There are different teachers for each part. I expect that's why it's two modules. Dr. Clare does the first part, but it's Dr. Shaker and Professor Lord for the second one. So that only leaves Peasants and Kings with Dr. Reeves. Oh, look, you have to know French for this one. Well, I must say I don't fancy any course that asks you to have Latin, but I think my French is good enough to read original sources. Yes, mine too. Well, what shall we choose? That is the end of section two. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear an interview between Dr. Mullet, a university lecturer, and a student, Fayed. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully to the interview and answer questions 21 to 25. So, Fayed, you found my office quite easily? Yes, thank you. Thank you for coming such a long way for the interview. I believe you are from the Middle East. Now, Fayed, I really wanted to speak to you during this interview about two things. Your exam results and your final year dissertation. Your thesis, your dissertation, that was something quite special. Your personal tutor actually sent me a copy, and I must say that for a third year undergraduate, it is a very polished piece of work. Thank you. Yes, it is very promising. Now, the thing is, your tutor tells me that you weren't all that happy with your exams. Well, the results aren't out yet, as you know. The first four were fine, but in the last three, I lost my nerve a bit and didn't do so well. I know I didn't do as well as I could. I was worried when I'd handed in my exams. Right. Well, the exams are a bit of a game anyway. We can't all do well on the day. But here, exam results are not everything, as you know. I set great store by other factors in deciding whether we offer you a place on the master's course. Perhaps you could tell me a little about how you became interested in economics. Yes, of course. Well, I've always been interested in social and economic history. So from a very young age, I read about the booms and crashes of the 19th and 20th centuries. I originally applied to study history at university. But when I got there, I realized I had the chance to study economics at a high level, so I changed. My mother used to be an economist at the World Bank, so I had her to help me and guide me, although she didn't help me write my final year paper. No, quite. Now, you're applying for the master's course in the economics of the developing world, taught by myself and Dr. Brannigan. Uh, why this particular course? Well, I've read some of your work on the development of rural banks, and I thought this was a good place to be. I mean, this is my first choice. 
Now you have some time to read questions 26 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the interview and answer questions 26 to 30. And you're not worried about feeling homesick? You are still young and Australia is a very long way from your home. I mean, your English is fine. There are no problems with language or attitude, but the distance from your family may make it hard for you at first. I've thought about that, but it's a problem wherever I go. If I don't get in here... I'll probably take a place at university in England. That's just as far from home. I see, I see. And what are your long-term ambitions, Fayed? What do you want to do ultimately with your qualifications and your life? I want to work in my country. You know there are some problems there. And I want to try to put right some of them in the economic infrastructure. I see. And this is your last interview, I believe. That gives you four weeks before the next term starts. What will you do during your holidays? Oh, I am going to relax. I was going to work on my English, but in fact I've got a couple of friends in Hamburg, so I think I'll go and stay with them instead, as I've never been to Germany. I see. Well, Fayed, as you know, I can't give you a decision right away. However, I can tell you that you've made quite an impression with your application, and I think you should not worry too much about the place. My decision will be made tomorrow after I've seen the last candidate, and I'll let you know within the next two weeks. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for attending the interview. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a lecturer give a talk on nutrition. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 31 to 40. Now, the topic of today's talk is nutrition, specifically vitamins and minerals. I'll be dealing first with some of the most common misconceptions about them. Then I'm going to talk about what vitamins there are, where they come from, and the quantities we need. We'll have some time at the end of the talk for any questions you may have. OK. Well, vitamins are known to the general public. In fact, the public knows more about them than it does about certain other key aspects of nutrition. One reason for this is that vitamins have been in the public eye for quite a while, at least since the middle of the 20th century, when their importance first became widely recognised. This awareness does mean that the public knows how important vitamins are, even if it doesn't mean that we all eat a healthy diet all the time. However, a problem does arise that is associated with this, which is the number of old wives' tales about vitamins. Usually these fallacies are not dangerous, but they do lead to an unnecessarily high intake of vitamin supplements. For example, it is widely held that high doses of vitamin C 
will cure colds and flu. I'd like to hit this one on the head. There is no evidence that any vitamin can cure anything. No, I'm afraid you'll just have to let time sort out your cold. And of course, the body can't store vitamin C. So those tablets you take are just an expensive waste of time. Another common belief with no evidence is the idea that vitamin A helps you see in the dark. Actually, there is some truth in this one because vitamin A is necessary for good vision. But in the dark, in real darkness, nobody can see. And of course, taking too much vitamin A can actually be bad for you. But perhaps the most misleading idea heavily promoted by certain companies is that vitamins will make you intelligent. Now, while a healthy diet is essential if you are to make the most of your intelligence, there is no evidence whatsoever that vitamin supplements can make the slightest bit of difference. So what can vitamins do? Or perhaps more accurately, why do we need them? Well, the answer is that we need them for all sorts of reasons. Vitamin A, for example, also called retinol, is essential for good eyesight, especially at night, and to help us fight off infection and illness. We get it from liver, butter, egg yolks and milk. Vitamin D, as is well known, is used to build strong teeth and bones, but it also helps us absorb calcium. Vitamin D is mainly formed in the skin through the action of sunlight. How much you need depends on different factors such as age and health. Vitamin E, tocopherol, is less well known but is necessary in maintaining a healthy balance of fats in the body. We need 10 to 12 milligrams every day and although some people take supplements, you can normally get what you need from a balanced diet. The B complex includes vitamins B1, thiamine, B2, riboflavin, B6, pyridoxine and B12, cyanocobalamin. It performs many functions, including allowing our bodies to metabolize carbohydrates, forming healthy tissue, and perhaps most importantly, forming red blood cells to prevent pernicious anemia. We need varying amounts of the B complex, and while most of us can get enough from a well-balanced diet, vegetarians may find themselves deficient in B12, which is only found in any noticeable quantity in meat, especially liver. Finally, vitamin C is the one everyone knows. Ascorbic acid, as it's also known, helps fight infection, which perhaps accounts for the myth about preventing colds. It also helps protect against scurvy. We need 30 milligrams a day and can only really get this amount from eating plenty of citrus fruit and fresh vegetables. Now, in a moment I'll be moving on to talk about how we can plan a diet which will supply all our vitamin needs. But before that, I'd like to look at some of the recent advances in our knowledge of the ways vitamin deficiencies can affect us. That is the end of section 4. You will have half a minute to check your answers.